caused the early church a lot of consternation and troubles. And a passage which uh, Paul had to deal with because certain people were teaching back then at the early church that in order to be saved, one had to be circumcised. And uh, they were talking, you know, saying, you know, you, that Gentile believers had to be circumcised and had to come and fulfill the law. And, you know, the passages that they were pointing to um, is verse 14 of chapter 17, which says, Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And basically the argument there is the people of God are the people of faith, the people of the church. And so here it's a plainly teaching taught that if you're not circumcised, you're cut off from the people of God. And if you're cut off from the people of God, therefore you cannot be saved. And Paul had to deal with this passage in Galatians and we'll touch upon how he dealt with it. But the basic argument is this that Paul presented. If you remember a few weeks back, we referred to uh, Genesis chapter 15. Verse 6, and it says this there, and you said, I'm just going to modify a little to make it clear. And Abraham believed the Lord, and God counted it to him as righteousness. And basically, Paul's argument was this that the promise came before the circumcision, and that Abraham's justification. Being declared righteous before God came before the circumcision. So therefore, circumcision is not a prerequisite unto salvation. So that becomes, you know, what is circumcision and how does it fit and how does it apply to us today? When we look at uh, chapter 17 of Genesis, it says, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between you, between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you and, shall be with, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram. But your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you the father of multiple nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come forth from you. And I will establish my covenant between you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give you and your offspring after you the land of your sojourners, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession. I will be their God. When we look at this covenant and we can go on and look at all this, we find out that Abraham does go and circumcises everybody. But here you find that God is formally again a for, he's making a formal commitment to his covenant and he's asking Abram to live, walk before him and his righteousness in him and what a covenant what we have to understand about a covenant a covenant is different from a contract a contract is an agreement between two or more parties for the exchange of goods and services. I pay you X amount of dollars for X amount of pounds of pecans, or you know, that's a contract. You make a deal there, or if you, you, there's, a, it's a, there's an exchange of product, an exchange of goods and services. Well, a covenant is beyond that. A covenant is actually a commitment to maintain a certain relationship. That's why marriage is a covenant relationship. Because the task may be different in different marriages. You may work out how you divide the labor differently in each marriage. But it's the relationship of that marriage. That special unified, that special intimate relationship of husband and wife. That is brought together in the union of marriage. That is why it's a covenant. 
Also, treaties between nations are more covenants than contracts because you're talking about a relationship between this nation and that nation. So a contract looks at goods and services. A covenant looks at the relationship and defines that relationship and then both parties are committed to maintaining that relationship. And so God is coming and you know there are certain things that God has promised to Abraham and you'll notice that in this promise it's the same promises that he's given before. He's given the promise of land and promise of of descendants and, and making a nation out of Abraham. Those promises are already been given to Abraham and they're already his by earlier commitments. What's new in this one is that now God expands the promises to Abram's descendants. And the thing that he basically says is that I will be their God. And so through the covenant of circumcision, Abraham was marking his descendants, his descendants, as having a special relationship with God. Now circumcision was not unheard of or unknown in the ancient world. In fact, in Egypt, uh, when a boy who was going to become part of the priesthood turned age 13, he was circumcised. In fact, in Egypt, it was very common for the priest to be circumcised. And it basically meant that they were set apart for the God, to serve that God for the rest of their lives. So when we have Abraham circumcising, he's understanding that he is dedicating these people, he is, he is associating them, he is linking them to the service of God. That, the, that his descendants will be followers of God. In a simple way, it's a statement of saying, as for me and my household, we will follow the Lord. Now note, the promises are not necessarily based upon the circumcision. The promises were given to Abraham and were already secure. But here it's being extended now you'll notice if you go through the passage, you'll notice that God goes on and tells Abraham now, in beginning in verse 9, he says, And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall circumcise in the flesh of your, of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner, you who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall Surely be circumcised, so shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Now notice here also that the circumcision wasn't just something given to Abraham's immediate biological descendants. It was a household affair. In other words, it extended to everybody that Abraham had uh, authority over, Abraham had control over, including his slaves. In other words, when God was making this covenant with Abraham, he was not just looking at Abraham as an individual. He was looking at Abraham as a, as a household, as a with all the folks that he was responsible for. And everybody that Abraham was responsible for was included in this covenant. It did not matter whether you were a born son, part of the inheritance, or were a slave bought from a foreigner. You were still and brought in to this special relationship. You are still brought in to this commitment that you are going to be identified with the Lord. Now this did not mean certain things. This did not guarantee that these individuals were saved. We know in this text that Abraham was saved, but we really don't know about the other individuals. 
And if you go further into the story of Genesis, you will find Jacob. We know Jacob was circumcised. But if you go through and you look, read through the life of Jacob, Jacob spent most of his life fighting with God. In fact, if you go to the Jacob's Ladder, the stairway to heaven, the original stairway to heaven, he, you find that you know, Jacob has this vision and he sees angels going up to the Lord and coming back down. And God reveals himself to Jacob and God says, I'm going to be with you during your time of exile. And if you listen to Jacob's words when he gets up the next morning and he puts the offering on it, these are his words. He says, as he pours out the offering, if the Lord will be with me, through my exile, and brings me back home safely. Now notice there's an if in front of that. A conditional clause. If God does this, this, and this, then there's a comma, then the Lord will be my God. In other words, Jacob did not believe and trust in the Lord at this point in his life. It isn't until way later that he does. So what's going on here? He was circumcised, but he wasn't saved. We don't know about Ishmael, but we also know some other things about Ishmael, that God did have plans and partially fulfilled his promises to Abraham in Ishmael. So what is going on with the circumcision? If it's not guaranteeing salvation, what is it guaranteeing? What is it giving? If you look back and look at our phrases as we read through, you'll see a phrase that's repeated over and over. At the very end of verse 8, you'll see it. I will be their God. God constantly says over and over, I will be their God. For every generation, I will be their God. Now this is not a generic declaration. Because in a one sense, in a generic sense, God is the God of all people, regardless of whether they acknowledge Him or not. You know, even the atheist, God is his God. Then one day he will stand before God and have to give an account. God is even the God of those who follow Muhammad. He's the God of the Hindus. He's the God of everybody. Whether they acknowledge Him or not, for one thing, He is the only God. The second thing, He is the Creator God, in that He has created them. The third thing is that He is the sustaining God, in that He sustains their lives, even though they do not worship Him. And finally, He is the God who they will be accountable to. For it is appointed once a man to die, and then after that the judgment. And when they stand before the judgment seat, it's not going to be Allah, it's not going to be some Hindu God, it's not going to be some Mormon God, it's going to be the God Creator, the God of the Bible, who they will stand before and have to give an account for their lives. We're not talking about that here, even though you could conclude that, but this is something more than just that generic sense that God will be God over all. What we find is that God will be their God. And what that simply means is that God will be watching over their lives. He will intervene and interpose in their lives and will interact in their lives. We do see that later on, especially with Jacob, because most of the narrative of Jacob is Jacob struggling with God and God intervening and helping him, even though he, Jacob was not worthy of God's help. But he was of the descendant of Abraham. We find this in many cases, you know, even in the case of Ishmael, God was involved in the life of Ishmael. God rescued Ishmael twice, intervened on his behalf, not because he was necessarily saved. We don't really know that one way or the other, like Abraham, meaning that he believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. We don't know that one way or the other historically. The Bible doesn't tell us, but the Bible does show us that God was intimately involved in his life and in his care for and made sure that he was able to establish himself, even though it was hard. His life was in a very difficult situations, but God was there involved in his life. 
So what does it mean? In this circumcision we find several things about. It was not magical. It was not something magical. It did not give the Israelites any special power. But it did say that God was interested in their lives. Also, it was a sign of this covenant. The circumcision itself was not what was important. But it was the sign that they were part of the people of God. It marked them off. It separated them from the world. So that they would be distinct from the world. That they would be a different people. Reminding them on a daily basis that they were not like others. But that they belonged to the Lord. And of course, this circumcision points to God. And it calls upon them to surrender their lives, to believe God and to trust God. And if they would believe and trust God, it would be accounted to them as righteousness, just as it was done for Abraham. After all, all the true descendants of Abraham, in the most truest sense of all, are those who believe God and are declared righteous by God because of that. It is not that they were circumcised that makes us righteous, it is that they believe God. Now you ask, how does that apply to today? Well, you'll note if you go over into Acts chapter 16, that there is household baptisms in the New Testament. There's actually two of them. And the one that I'm going to focus in on is Lydia's. If you remember the story, Paul is preaching there in Macedonia near Philippi. And he comes into Philippi and there's not a synagogue there. But he goes by the river where there's a prayer meeting. And he meets a group of ladies who are conducting a prayer meeting. And one of those ladies is a lady by the name of Lydia. And afterwards, she comes and we're told that she and her household are baptized. And then she comes to Paul afterwards and appeals to Paul to come and live with her in her household. Now if you'll look at the words there in Acts 16, 15, she doesn't appeal to the belief of her household. She says, if you truly think I am a believer, will you come? But you have to understand, she had everybody in her household baptized. It was a household baptism. She was committing that she and her, her household, her business, were all going to be lived for the Lord. Now we don't know if every one of her servants or slaves, or if she had children, if they actually believed. We're not told that in the text. We're only told that she believed. Now, notice she did not appeal to Paul on the basis of her baptism. I have been baptized, so come and stay. She says, if you really believe, if you count me as a true believer, come and stay. She distinguished her faith from her baptism. Yes, in her baptism, she dedicated her house, herself, or identified herself with Christ and the way of Christ and to follow Christ. And we know from history that this the Philippian church was a major supporter of Paul and a church that gave Paul many blessings. And it's interesting that this is one church that there was only a minor problems in, not major problems. But this is a place where the whole household committed themselves to following God, where the leader of the household committed them to following the Lord. So what we find is that there's a similarity. Just as circumcision was the sign of the Abrahamic covenant, baptism is the sign of the new covenant. Neither are magical. Neither one does anything special to the individual in and of itself. But they are a sign, a token of something greater. That God is interested and involved in life. So when we baptize, and we as Methodists, we will, you know, our Baptist friends only have believers' baptism. But when we baptize a child, 
We are saying we are, we are identifying ourselves with the people of God. We are identifying this child with the people of God. And God has a special interest in the life of that individual. And even if they are not saved, even if they do not confess Christ, even if they do go off the deep end, God will be involved, intimately involved in that person's life. And we know the ultimate purpose of God's involvement in an individual's life. His ultimate purpose is to bring them to himself, to bring them to salvation. And that's what we call prevenient grace. This baptism nor the circumcision guaranteed salvation, but they were pointing out that salvation was a birthright, something that this individual should reach out and take for themselves and claim for themselves. Unfortunately, we have the example of Esau, who looked at it, despised his birthright and pushed it aside. Some will do that, but we always have to remind folks, baptism, just like circumcision, does not save. What saves is the God of circumcision, is the God of baptism. And we call upon people to believe and to trust in him to surrender their lives to Him, and to follow His ways. It is quite, Wesley has a whole sermon that I may just imitate one day, where he talks about, you're baptized, but deny your baptism by doing certain things. You know, God in this covenant called Abraham to walk righteously before Him. And in baptism, we are called to walk righteously before God. And so let us do so, recognizing that these tokens of circumcision, these tokens of baptism, they are there to remind us. They are there to help us to make a distinction in our mind between us and the world. But it is actually more important to be like the man on the cross who turned to Jesus and said, remember me when you're in your kingdom. That is more important, to ask God to remember us. Not merely be involved in our lives, but the place to surrender our lives to Him and to believe His message, especially about His Son dying on the cross to pay for our sins. Amen. Amen.